So um, when I was growing up and I thought about healthcare, I always imagined, you know, what can my doctor do for me? Um, what can my doctor do to treat me, cure me, care for me? If I had a heart attack, you know, my doctor would cure me. Um, if I broke my hip, my surgeon would fix me. And so I grew up wanting to be a doctor so I could cure people. And a year ago, I got my medical degree, and I officially became a doctor. But thank you. So it's funny that you guys clap, because the next sentence I was going to say is, um, but just as quickly, I in some ways unbecame one. Um, <laughs> So pretty much, I can say anything in this room and I'll get an applause. That's, that's been... <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so the reason I kind of started shifting gears was because I started to believe in something new. I started to believe that the future of healthcare wasn't going to look very much like the past. And so I'm here today hoping to convince you that the future of healthcare won't just be about what your doctor or your nurse can do for you, but it'll be about three new things. Number one, it'll be about what can I do as a patient to manage my own health, to be the quarterback of my own care. Number two, that technology, particularly the internet and mobile, will be the enablers that make this paradigm shift possible. And number three, and most importantly, that this digital health revolution, as we call it, won't necessarily come from people inside the healthcare system, but it will come from you, patients, innovators, technologists, from around the world who live outside the healthcare system, but really, really want to make it better. But before we can talk about the future, we need to talk about the past. We need to understand how our healthcare system has developed and where it's going. So over the last century, our healthcare system has become really, really good at treating people once they're sick. So if you have an infection, we have the antibiotic for you. If you need your knee replaced, your surgeon can fix it for you. And so a lot of the healthcare that we've given has come in a hospital where we treat really sick people. And so because we became very good at fixing people when they were sick, that's how our governments and how our health insurance companies started paying for healthcare. So, you know, we would pay doctors and nurses and hospitals for, you know, how long a patient stayed in hospital, or how many tests were done, or how many patients were seen, and so on. And so we would incentivize healthcare providers to do more based on, by paying them for how much they did, which made sense at the time, you know, um, the more sick people you treated, the more you got paid. But as our healthcare system got better, um, people started to live longer and be healthier, and we saw this rise of chronic disease. So as this graph from uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada shows, by the mid-20th century, chronic disease such as diabetes and heart disease and so on became leading causes of death. And because people started living longer, we also started doing surgery on people when they were older, and that makes them higher, at higher risk of complications. And so our healthcare system should have evolved to focus on preventing people from getting sick and keeping you healthy in the community, but in many ways, it didn't really. And by the 21st century, we were still mostly paying healthcare providers to treat people when they were sick and not really paying them to keep you healthy. And this is a big problem because healthcare is really, really expensive when someone gets sick. And so because our funding models in healthcare didn't evolve, our healthcare system didn't evolve with it, and so even though the needs of patients like you and me have changed over the last 50 years, we haven't really changed healthcare to fit those needs. Until recently, that is. You see, we've finally come to this really scary reality that healthcare isn't sustainable anymore. And how do we know that? So last year, Canada and the US spent $3 trillion on healthcare. $3 trillion. I can't even imagine what that might look like in bills. It must be a lot of briefcases. It's really big. <laughs> and you know, in 2012, Canada spent 10.9% um, of our GDP on healthcare. The US spent 16.9%. That's the highest among developed countries. And so 
these two countries, um, even though we have higher than average um, spend on percent GDP on healthcare among developed countries, we don't come anywhere close to the top of key healthcare outcomes. And so we know that we can and we must do better for our patients. And so now there's this shift in healthcare going on um, where we want healthcare providers to care more about preventing you from getting sick. And so we're starting to realize that maybe we start changing these incentive models, how we pay hospitals and doctors, and that might do something. So in 2010, here in Ontario, the government released the Excellent Care for All Act. And that made healthcare providers and hospital executives more accountable for how well you guys did at patients. So for example, they started tying um, hospital executive payment to how well patients would do. In the States, uh, through the Affordable Care Act, or as you guys might know, Obamacare, um, that came to effect also in 2010, and that brought even more dramatic changes in the way we pay for healthcare. So over the past few years, many hospitals in the States have been penalized millions of dollars for having too many patients unexpectedly come back to hospital within a month of leaving. So we're seeing these major shifts in how healthcare is paid for, from paying for quantity to paying for the quality of care that you're getting. And so now, for the first time in history, healthcare providers and hospitals have to work together to keep patients healthy and out of hospital. Now that's not easy to do. That's actually really hard. I mean, imagine you're a doctor who, before you just had to care about how patients did inside the hospital, and all of a sudden now you're being asked to care for people outside the hospital as well. How do you manage that? We're gonna get back to that, but I wanna shift gears a bit and talk a bit about something else happening all the while over the last few years in the technology world. So every now and then, uh, a new technology comes into existence that changes the way we live our lives. In the 70s, uh, we had the home computers. In the 90s, we had the internet. And most recently, uh, we've had this explosion of mobile technology. So things like smartphones and tablets have changed the way we live our lives. Today, more than a billion people in this world have access to a mobile device. Certainly by 2020, almost every single person on this planet will have access to the internet, be connected to each other through a mobile device. And yeah, I think it's awesome. <laughs> um, but from my point of view, one of the most amazing things about this is that it creates this unprecedented opportunity to bring healthcare to people everywhere no matter where you are, no matter where you live. And you know, when there's suddenly this new game-changing opportunity to be able to deliver something to you know, billions of people around the world, humanity finds a way to make it easy to do so. So today, it is now easier and cheaper than ever to build software, to write an app that can reach millions, if not billions of people around the world. I mean, back in 2004, um, Facebook was started. In 10 months, they had a million users. By 2012, they had a billion users. Instagram was started six years after Facebook. They reached their millionth user in less than two and a half months. And so the rate at which you can reach people around the world now through mobile is just um, exponential and it's, it's amazing. So let's recap for a bit. You know, we've learned that the healthcare system has completely started changing the way it's paying for healthcare. Um, and now they're in urgent need of new solutions uh, to keep people engaged and healthy in the community. But in healthcare, we have limited resources, we have limited people. And so the question is, how do you bring healthcare to people around the world in a way that's cost effective and scalable? Number two, you know, we're in the midst of this digital health revolution with better access to mobile and the internet than ever before. And number three, you know, now that anyone who can write software can reach people all around the world, um, we can do amazing things. So let's put that together. You have this healthcare system that really, really needs new solutions. And we live in a world now where anyone, so not just healthcare providers, not just really big companies, anyone who can write code and build a product can make a dramatic impact on the health of millions of people around the world. How do I know that's possible? Because that's what we're doing today. So um, when we started our digital health startup, Seamless MD, we were just three guys with a dream. Um, I was in my last year of med school. Uh, my co-founders you see here, Philip and Wooly, they were in their last years of their first degree of university. And before we even graduated, we had convinced this hospital to use our platform. And when we think about it, we ask ourselves, you know, what business did three guys like us have actually believing that a hospital would say yes? 
we were young, we had no resources. Um, sure, I was in medical school, but I wasn't even a real doctor yet. And there were a million reasons why that hospital could have said no. Um, for sure, at least a million. And I'm so glad they didn't, because if they had, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. So what does Seamless MD do? I think the best way to show you is for you to meet David. So David is a journalist, he's a PR specialist and an entrepreneur. A few months ago, David was diagnosed with lung cancer. And as David told me, he said, you know, when you hear for the first time from your surgeon that you have a malignant tumor and you need surgery, you just stop listening to the words your surgeon is saying. You go home and your mind is just racing with questions. And the thing about surgery is that until you actually have it, something you might not realize is that the actual surgery itself is a really small part of that entire patient journey. So everything you see in red here is everything a patient might have to do to prepare for surgery and to recover afterwards. It's a lot. And the scary thing is we live in the 21st century and despite how complicated this whole journey is through surgery, we still rely on paper and verbal instructions to get a patient through this journey. But David's story ends up being a bit different. As it turns out, David's surgeon is an early adopter and pioneer in technology. This is Dr. Carmine Simone. He's a lung cancer surgeon and the chief of surgery at Toronto East General Hospital. And I'm so proud to say that he's been an early adopter and a champion of ours since the very, very beginning. And so when David learned that he would need surgery, he also learned from Dr. Simone that he would be getting seamless to help him through that journey. So it was okay that David was stunned to learn he had lung cancer and that he couldn't remember what Dr. Simone was saying. With Seamless, every day, both David and his wife would get reminders leading up to the surgery, telling him how to prepare, what to bring to hospital, when to stop certain medications. And if he ever felt unsure of what to do next, he could access videos on our platform made personally by Dr. Simone. So two and a half weeks ago, David had his actual surgery. And he continued to use Seamless as he went through his recovery. So every day, David's been going on our application, and he's been tracking how he's feeling, any symptoms he's feeling. And every day, it gives him personalized feedback about what to do if something's wrong. So now, patients like David actually know how to safely manage their recovery and when to get help from a doctor and how if they need to. And so by empowering patients like David to be more engaged in their recovery, we also help hospitals catch complications like infections earlier and prevent costly visits back to the hospital. And this is really important, especially for patients like David, who often live you know, hours and hours away from the actual hospital. Now, we aren't the only ones working on problems like this. There are hundreds of startups now trying to solve some of the most pressing problems in healthcare today. In 2013, there are actually already over 40,000 healthcare apps in existence, many of which were meant to help patients manage their own health. But what's amazing isn't just the pure volume of innovation happening right now in the space. What's even better is that we are starting to break down barriers to making digital health meaningful and connected in our actual healthcare system. So earlier this year, if you've been following um, Apple, they released their HealthKit platform. And HealthKit uh, will now come on every new Apple device and it integrates uh, with fitness trackers, um, monitoring devices, other applications, and it brings all your healthcare information into one place. Whether it's your blood pressure, your sugar levels, your medical history, it's now all in one place. And Apple is now starting to integrate this platform with um, apps from the Mayo Clinic. It's integrating with some of the leading electronic medical record systems in North America. And really, the importance of that is over time, we're gonna see more and more integrations between third-party systems and the healthcare system itself, making it easier than ever for doctors and patients to connect. And I think what's most important is that these are signs that this digital health ecosystem is really expanding, and that it's gonna become even easier for people like you and me to build solutions that can actually impact the lives of patients and doctors. But let me be clear. Um, you know, as easy as it's going to be to start building solutions in healthcare, um, that doesn't mean it's easy to have a real important impact. Um, you know, it's not about circumventing the healthcare system. It's not about going rogue and trying to solve these really hard problems on your own without talking to patients, doctors, or hospitals. 
That's not what Seamless MD is, did, and that's not what you guys should do either. The reason we've been successful is because we realized early on that um, we all need to work together. We realize that technology alone is not an effective solution. And so, you know, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a patient or a coder or a designer, we have to come together and make sure whatever we build has real positive impact. So, you know, we'll always need doctors and nurses to care for patients, to prevent us from getting sick, and to cure us when we do. But these healthcare providers also need our expertise to help engage and empower patients to be managers of their own health. And you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to actually build something that can really change how healthcare is done today. So if you've ever in your life wanted to make the world healthier, the time is now. So come join the digital health revolution and build the solutions that will keep our patients and your family safe and connected and able to manage their own care from the comfort of your own home. The future of healthcare depends on it and depends on you. Thank you. <laughs>